Please join me in welcoming our panelists for Revolutionizing Protest, Technology as a Platform for Social Change. Chase Iron Eyes, Lead Dakota Counsel at the Lakota People's Law Project, Julieta Garibay, Campaigns Director at United We Dream, Sam Sinyangwe, Data Analyst and Co-Founder of Campaign Zero, Shauna Thomas, Co-Founder and Co-Executive Director at Ultraviolet, and our moderator, Panama Jackson, Co-Founder of VerySmartBrothers.com. Everybody doing? We need a little more energy. We want to make sure we have a lot of energy on this panel. So can we get us uh, some energy? Can we get some, uh, you know? We have people up on stage who are doing the work, so you know I want to make sure that we give proper deference. Uh, my name is Panama Jackson. I'm co-founder of VerySmartBrothers.com, uh, a website that largely deals in uh, pop culture, satirization, relationships, race, whatever's going on in Black America or in America generally. Um, that's dealing with black people typically. Um, and I want to say I'm honored to be here today on stage with these individuals. Um, and also, we have Aaron Horn McKinney from uh, Black Female Founders here, who uh, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't announced on the, what do you call it, the voice of God? That was very awesome. <laughs> I've never heard that term before, by the way, so that kind of threw me for a loop. I had to hear that a couple times. Um, I often wonder about the people who create the technologies that we've been using now. Like when, when they created Twitter, did they think about it in terms of the future? Like did they think 140 characters can change the world, right? Um, Facebook, I, you know, we, were, we all started using that as a way to connect with people on, on college campuses across the nation. And now it's a vital organizing tool, especially for underserved communities. Um, long gone are the days of you know, knocking on doors, going door to door and, and canvassing. You know, you, you, you drop an announcement on Facebook now and it reaches everybody you're trying to reach, or most people that you're trying to reach almost immediately. And it reminds me of, uh, I, I like to think about Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, right? You know, he wrote this, this was a, a call to nonviolent resistance in the face of waiting, right? You know, waiting for the courts to do the work. And, you know, it took a long time for that to circulate through the communities it needed to reach. And that was written in April, I believe, is through the end of the summer before it really got, got, got full potency. Whereas now, Dr. King would have a Facebook page, he would drop that bad boy, and it would be shared by like 100,000 people in with like, within like an hour. And you know that famous quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. Hope I said that properly. Like that would be all over, there would be memes about that like all over the place within like five minutes, right? I mean, Kermit the Frog would have a meme that said that. Like it would just be, it would be everywhere, right? So. Um, you know, when I think of from Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and I am not up on Snapchat. I, I honestly, for the life of me, cannot figure out how to use Snapchat. My nephews try to explain this to me. My social media competency has ended at Facebook, and I'm okay with that. I'm a little older, and I'm just, I'm just gonna have to suck that one up. I'm, I'm starting to delve into my parents' territory. Um, not as bad as what's that computer thing you're using, but you know, I'm okay. Um, you know, we're using all these platforms and people doing the work now are able to reach all the people they're, they're, they need to reach and are able to sustain and create these movements quickly in a ways that, that engage people that weren't, weren't able to be engaged before. And this is all in net positive as far as I'm concerned. And I think most of us, probably everybody on stage who's using it for these purposes, probably views it in that fashion. You know, from the Arab Spring to Ferguson to Baltimore to recent shenanigans with Pepsi and, and Shea Moisture to, some, to a lesser extent, um, and everywhere in between, social media has become a catalyst for revolution. It's been, it's been a way to, to, to energize everybody. Um, hashtags have taken over, right? We're able to use a hashtag to start something from one of my favorites, If They Gun Me Down, was one of my, one of my favorites. I love watching that all over Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and seeing how people um, juxtapose the picture that certain communities would be using versus how you know, how they should be viewing us, right? Or how other communities got that, got that grace, so to speak. Um, say her name, everyday sexism, yo casis, no DAPL. Um, Black Lives Matter, obviously. Um, they're all shining a light on these necessary issues and, and 
and centering the narrative on, on putting what's most importantly at stake, the humanity of these underserved communities that never really get that shine. We, now, as communities of color, we all typically do this with a certain humor that I think we need, to, we need the humor to, to, to laugh to keep from crying a lot of times. But under, underlying all of those um, very funny hashtags is a real pain and a real cry for you know, equality and understanding and humanity. So, you know, hashtag stay woke, right? Um, we have a long way to go. We're getting there. We're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of, of, of um, equality. But we're moving in the right direction. We're, trying, we're getting there. And, and you'll see from the people that are on stage are all vital in the work to getting us there. Um, I have the benefit of kind of sitting removed from it and documenting the struggle, the progress, so to speak. I mean, that's one of the roles that we play when we're, we're, we're media outlets. Um, and those that are, are independently owned, like VSB, where we get to kind of say what we want to say the way we want to say it, we get the pleasure of documenting these things for, for posterity, um, while the people that I'm on stage with are doing the things that I get to write about proudly often. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everybody kind of introduce themselves, give you a short bio, and then we'll kind of jump right into um, the reason why we're here. And I do want to say on a personal note, I'm familiar with everybody here. I, I actually am familiar with all your organizations. Um, so I'm proud to be here. Thank you all, for even, thank you, all uh, you know, Future of Wealth Summit for having me here to do this. So let's get it going. So we'll start over here. Um, thank you. I'm Erin Horn McKinney from Black Female Founders. Um, I'm also a communication scientist who studies uh, movement, social change movements online. And um, we started kind of like uh, just quickly to kind of explain what, what Black Female Founders is. It's a membership organization and community and movement um, that started really just out of seeing that there were not a lot of events and things that focused on uh, black women specifically in tech who are entrepreneurs. It's different to be somebody who is, um, is coding or an employee, but it's a whole other thing if you have to like make payroll, right? And you have to try to go seek funding. And so we really started that as a really small group um, that was only going to be like a dinner group and kind of a support group, if you will. And then we uh, had a lot of people asking to participate and it quickly became a, uh, we went to Google and said, hey, we're gonna have an event here and it'll be like maybe 20 people. Google here in DC, and it quickly became an RSVP list of over 200 people. And, um, and so we, we had our first event and we were blown away. And we'll never forget that day because the same day that Prince died. So it's like ingrained in our R. minds, R. unfortunately. Right, exactly. So it was, we played Prince music, you know, so we got, supported each other through that event. But the thing that I'll say is that, you know, as it relates to kind of a movement, it, within less than three months, we had over like a thousand people following us on Twitter, following us on, um, uh, creating a Facebook group and things like that. And it was just like, we were blown away. We call it kind of our oops baby, right? Because we weren't really planning on starting an organization, but there was clearly a need. Um, but as somebody who like, you know, got into this space because of being an activist um, about women and minority participation in the innovation economy, it's something that uh, we have been able to see like a major change. And, and, and I just wanna thank you all for having me and participating because this is exactly like what I live for each and every day. Uh, thank you. Uh, like, my name is Chase Iron Eyes, and I'm from uh, the original homelands of the Lakota Nation, the, uh, the Sioux Nation, the Sioux people, out, out there in the middle of what is now uh, the United States. And I am uh, the founder of uh, an, uh, an organization, a media movement called Last Real Indians. It's a, it's a cheeky name. You know, I was well aware. I, I'm, I'm, I studied political science and um, uh, I went to law school. I became, I went, went into a, a obscene amount of debt to ob obtain a Jewish doctorate. So I named uh, our platform Last Real Indians because it calls into question what, what is the last of something or, or anything, what, is, what, is, what defines who is a real uh, quote-unquote Indian or an original person, which is what we call ourselves in this land, and what is an Indian. Those are all very complex uh, discussions and concepts, 
But when we, when we started uh, our media movement, which was started as a, as a brain trust, uh, uh, these things often start with just a few people getting together. You know, I started blogging and, and calling myself the last real Indian. I, I, because I knew it was, it was going to piss people off and make people wonder what, <laughs> this guy ain't the last real Indian, you know what I mean? <laughs> and as soon as I had 10,000 individual hits on, on my old blog spot, I realized that there was potential here. So I called up other people who I knew were introspective, who I knew they were dynamite. They were nerds. They were people I could rely on to write you know, uh, in a, a 2,000 word article every week. So I've, I've seen sort of the, the evolution or uh, may, maybe even the, the, the regression or whatever the opposite of evolution is from the time when we were able to start creating our own content on these new digital platforms <laughs> and we were able to go viral, we were able to uh, have an, an authentic thrust of, of, of our conceptions or our content or our movement reach people who pr prior to these technologies and these platforms we, we were not able to reach. But now we have definitely seen our, uh, our collective attention spans go to uh, the, the length of a vine or, or a right. snap. Nobody reads 2,000 word articles anymore. If there's any writers in here, I'm sure you can, you can appreciate that. That's right. It hurts. Like you, you, it, it hurts. hurts. You, can't it hurts. Drop, you can't drop a, a, a thousand word article and expect people to pay attention to it. But if you craft the right meme or the right you know, 10 second video, it's like bait. You got to throw some bait out there now and, and loop people in. And for, for, for us, you know, for we who are trying to create content, trying to like, determine the trajectory of, of our planet, because we don't, media has to have a purpose. Otherwise, for me, what, what use is it? And we put our media to work in as early as the Keystone XL pipeline fight, when, when Black Lives Matter started, we, uh, tried to synergize with that movement and started documenting Native Lives Matter just because we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're like forgotten a lot, of the, a lot of the times. We're just, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're uh, so our narrative is completely uh, undervalued and, and missing from uh, you know, the, the, whole, the collective of, of what we're doing today in 2017. But that's changing. When the brother, brother here says we're on a, on a different path, you take a look at the No Dapple movement. And we were able to document in real time what was going down on the front line. And in North Dakota, in the Northern Plains, like mainstream media is, is a couple few small media organizations that almost work hand in glove as, <laughs> as a propaganda machine with the forces who were uh, pretty much telling us that, you know, we're going to put this pipeline in your backyard by gunpoint. Uh, you, you saw the marriage of, of the corporate state with these arms and institutions of the nation state. And so to, to sum up the intro, like, we don't know where we're going right now, but where, what we do know is that there's a financialization. There's an aspect of what's happening to our online presence, our real people online presence that we uh, need to be aware of and there's enough people in this room right here and, and the type of people who are, are on the stage here who can kind of help democratize that and keep it so that it reflects the real things that we want it to reflect not necessarily what any other institution wants it to reflect thank you by the way a thousand words on Beyonce will be read through and through we have learned <laughs> that at VSD that in black women and natural hair that's always a thing um, <laughs> better? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julieta Garibay. I'm part of United We Dream, uh, one of the co-founders and the campaign director currently. Um, I, I was undocumented for 24 years of my life. 
Um, and the vast majority of them, I was not hashtag undocumented and unafraid. Um, on the contrary, I was very afraid and very ashamed of being undocumented. Uh, but it was through the movement that I actually was able to be empowered to really lose that fear and that shame of being undocumented. Uh, and it's been through United We Dream and the movement that we've really been able to uplift uh, our stories, to realize that as we tell our stories, as we tell our truths online um, and offline, that's how we really not only engage our people, but really get them to fight for their lives. Um, and so it's been uh, an amazing journey. I think a lot of what we always say, our, our usual thing is, if it's not on Twitter or on Facebook, it didn't happen. Because we know that that's, right. that's right. how we need to roll, right? Um, that's how you're really able to uplift when ice barges into someone's home in the middle of the morning or at 5 a.m. and terrorizes children. Uh, we also know that even, I, I was coming over here and I was remembering, I started doing this work about 12 years ago um, and many of us were very scared and so we started on blogs uh, where it was like using pseudonyms and like making it very like, oh, um, someone else. I, I used to do Dream Elder, so that's my Twitter handle, but I used to be Dream Elder and that's how we kind of started. Many of us using pseudonyms, but now as we continued on, people started doing like, fit, I guess what you call now Facebook Lives, but it was like video recordings of people coming out and saying, I am undocumented. And so you still get stories of people saying, I was friends with this person for many years and it was through this video where he or she came out that even though we had been friends for years, I found out he was undocumented or she was undocumented. And so I think that really uplifts the power of the online world where you're able to share like, this is my truth. Um, and I am undocumented and now I can say I'm undocumented and unafraid. Um, and I can follow my, the other leaders that say so. Uh, but it's been through social media that's really we've been able to not only um, humanize our stories, uh, but actually get to how United We Dream started, which was getting people to acknowledge our humanity um, in, in ways that they had and actually acknowledging our existence in the US. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, yeah, so I'm Sam Sinyangwe, co-founder of Campaign Zero. Um, and you know, I got into this work. Technology facilitated my entry into this work. Um, you know, I was working at an Oakland nonprofit as the protests began in Ferguson and sort of reverberated across the country. Um, and I wanted to figure out how to get involved. Uh, at the time, there was a big controversy going on on Twitter. Uh, the movie Selma was going to come out. Oprah was saying that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't have clear leaders or demands, and it was like a whole thing. Um, and at the time, DeRay McKesson posted a tweet that said, here are the Ferguson protester demands. So I replied to that tweet. I just saw it on my timeline. I replied to it. I said, you know, I can help uh, build a policy platform that can translate these demands into um, policy solutions to end police violence. And he sent me his phone number. Uh, we got on the phone that day. Like, I did not know him. I'd never met him. Uh, we got on the phone that day. We were on the phone the next day. Uh, we started dra drafting and sharing back and forth uh, policy agenda outline. Um, and those initial conversations literally led to the development of Campaign Zero, which is a, p a policy organization within the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and we've been organizing at the local, state, and federal level to implement um, evidence-based policy solutions to end police violence ever since. Um, another story around data, right? So we think about technology through Twitter. Twitter has been this infrastructure, a digital infra organizing infrastructure that has allowed us to connect to one another. Um, it allowed me to connect to the It allowed uh, folks all across the country and if indeed the world to connect around common issues represented by hashtags um, in a way that has been so revolutionary. Uh, so when you think about technology, it's also the structure of those platforms that matters as well. So I think about the difference between you know, Facebook and Twitter. So, you know, Facebook, you are connected to your network. Uh, and if you are, you know, low income, person of color, uh, your network is not going to be very large. You're not going to be connected to people uh, in DC or people, you know, in LA, uh, people in New York City, to people who have contacts and influence or social human capital or financial capital. Um, but in Twitter, you're actually in a conversation and able to organize and connect with everybody around the world who shares a common interest uh, on, represented by that issue that you're talking about. So if the issue is police violence, suddenly um, your world is opened up in terms of who you can connect to and who you can build with. I think that's actually revolutionary. Um, the second piece is around 
data, right? So not only has technology been useful in connecting, it's also been useful in getting access to really important information uh, and being able to use it to make the case for change. Uh, so you know, when the country was in the early days and, and weeks of the movement, as the country kept saying again and again and again uh, that there is a problem here, um, you know, the federal government would say, we don't collect comprehensive data on people killed by police. Uh, police would say, and conservatives would say, well, where are the, where's the data? We need to see the data. We don't know if uh, racial bias in policing is real without the data. And they would really discount community narratives and, and you know, the lived truth of so many people. Um, and so we built the most comprehensive database of people killed by police in the United States, and we did it um, through uh, local media searches, uh, through Google, right, through Google, um, alerts, which alerted us to new, new cases by keywords, um, and by synthesizing information from existing public uh, databases, so whether it's criminal records databases, social media profiles, obituaries, um, and we synthesized all that information that was available online and built a database uh, about twice as comprehensive as what the federal government had, had built. Um, and so it was incredibly powerful to be able to do that, and, and it didn't require a huge you know, organization or institution or a lot of funding. It required the ability to use technology uh, well and, and the ability to synthesize it and make it accessible uh, so that other people could learn from those findings and use it in their advocacy. Um, so you know, as, as the sort of panel goes on, um, I just want to preface it by saying I think technology has been incredibly empowering um, and organizing tool an advocacy tool, I think now what we're learning is that the other side is, is just as highly organized uh, and is able to use technology now. When you think about you know, what, whatever you call them, the Nazis or the alt-right, um, you know, they're using technology extremely well. Uh, and they have influenced, they influence the election, they are influencing you know, the debate, um, the public discourse in ways that um, now we have to figure out how to actually counter that as well. Um, so, so yeah. All right. So that's. What you just started to say kind of gets right into like one of the main questions I have about that's kind of centering the whole panel. And I think it's important to mention how the policy for people who are involved in the policy end of it, data matters immensely, right? You know, you can tell, you can have the, you can have a, a, bun, a, a litany of people with stories that all resonate, but they want to know the numbers, right? Because they need to be able to tie it to numbers. I've, I've worked in the policy field for a long time, and I, that is a very, that is a very uh, astute um, summary. Everybody here has to use technology and, and social media in, in, a, in a way to enhance the movement in, in a particular area. Everybody's move, movement is, is the same but different, right? We're all moving towards the same goal but in a different ways, and they're all very nuanced. So I'd kind of like to, how have you and your organizations in particular used social media to influence the movements that you're in, in particular that, that, that you're working on? So we'll start, we'll start over here and we'll, we'll just go around. Well, one way, and actually that's just very top of mind, is that um, the speaker this morning was Aaron Saunders from the Inclusive Innovation Incubator. And as a part of their week of welcome, black female founders led a uh, local event called Black Tech Matters. And we did the whole hashtag and everything and um, got probably close to 10 plus organizations locally to that work with um, you know, within the black tech community to really kind of pull together uh, individuals to highlight the work that they're doing um, and kind of, it's really kind of an underground movement because there's a lot of organizations that are meetups and um, uh, might help teach people how to code or working with youth and they really are like these unsung heroes that are really trying to make a difference and help um, onboard and support um, uh, individuals uh, to get into the innovation economy, which you know, to me is like so, so critical. I think it's kind of like sometimes we talk about it similarly to the civil rights movement in the way that like we, we, we can't leave anybody behind um, with this because it's like if you're not part of the innovation economy when the fact of the matter is is that tech really touches every a industry and every aspect of our lives these days. So we had that, um, that event just a week ago and it was amazing the amount of support that we got um, not just physically in presence but also online and then like NBC actually picked up a story about it and started talking about just this whole hashtag and it was just amazing to me not that really amazing I guess because we know what technology can do and 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 social media can do to start movements but just something that 
was just more like, hey, we're going to have this event to support this space that is opening in D.C. And the fact that this is, um, you know, the first of its kind in the, the district, but also nationally, right, that this space is representing an inclusive environment um, uh, in, in a city that is very diverse, but we're tr trying to really raise, raise awareness nationally and internationally about um, trying to get everyone underserved communities. And it's not just about color, it's about age, it's about um, you know, socioeconomic, it's about a lot of things to come together and that there, here's a space that no matter where you are in, in your journey that will help you. And um, the thing that's interesting about the space, and, and I don't, I think Aaron really touched on this, is that it is the first in the country to be um, located within a tech corridor, right? Um, so DC has a tech corridor and that space is located in it. It's the first tech corridor that includes a historically black college and university. Um, and these are big deals, right? Like this is, this is like how do we create this awareness and match um, getting students, because as we know, students have often been a part of major movements um, throughout history. And so that's just one recent one that I can think of that really just that our organization, Black Female Founders, has been a part of. Very interesting. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we started our media organization as a, as a spiritual brain trust. Because for us, when we think of what, what is the purpose of media, what is the purpose of technology, and the purpose of those institutions or those vehicles, in, in our mind, in a lot of people's mind, is to impart culture, is to impart values, is to impart worldviews. You know, for us, media is the songs that we learn from the birds, or, or the winds, or the changing of the seasons, or, or the four-leggeds, or the beings that swim, or the, the beings that fly, all, all these beings are older than human beings, according to our cosmology, which science will, will, is continuing to bear out. So when, when, when we talk about what media is, you know, they're, 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 we, we form to try to address the forces of colonization, the, the kind of colonization that resulted in, you know, slavery, resulted in genocide, resulted in the imposition of spiritual and legal, uh, for us, fictions, but to the West, doctrines, legal doctrines that expropriated land, resources, water, everything. There's that kind of colonization that we can address, that we are addressing through these digital platforms that, that result in things like uh, uh, racism, I guess, you know, where human beings are fighting each other over the phenotype of, of their biology, the color of their skin. Uh, we're, we're succumbing to the complexes that we're born into, the languages that we speak, uh, our cultures, and then there's this other level of colonization that happened to everyone, like every single human being alive today. Unless you're living in the Amazon and hunting and fishing and, and your economy is directly connected uh, to your food source, or you're somehow directly connected to, to the water or to the sacred sites. And that's what we were trying to do with our media, is we, we I, I've studied Western philosophy and, and, and religion and, and th those sorts of uh, places, th those spaces, those mindscapes. And it has left us collectively in this place where well, it, Nietzsche is saying God is dead and, and, there's, and, and, and media and technology is almost like our, that's our religion right now. That's, that's, who, that's who tells us who to be as human beings, what to value. The purveyors of, of cool and, and, and of what to buy next. Apple is going to drop the next flashy thing that I, that I need. And we are, we are taught to consume and to consume. So the purpose of our media is to try to return human beings to their spiritual nature. Which is, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a tall drink of water. That's a tall ask. Very tall. 
But we can, we can do it in small ways by just, by just creating those relationships, either with each other or, you know, America is 240 years old. America's mythology and cosmology needs to be rooted here. Where, where do we get our identity? D do we get it from the United States Constitution or, or do we get it from the institutions of media, of technology? That's where we get it right now. But the cosmologies that were here 10,000 years ago, get, we get it from the land and, and from the waters. And so we, that's where we need to go as, as a people. That was, by the way, that was very deep. I, I have to say, I, that was a, that was a tall, it was a tall ask, but that was also very, it was, I, that was, it went in direct, I didn't, I didn't even see it through. I've never actually viewed it through that lens before, but now that I have, I don't know that I'm going to not view it from that lens ever again. So thank you for that. So, um, so I think uh, it was through our hashtag, uh, here to stay. Uh, so it started um, as the Supreme Court was deciding should parents of U.S. citizen or legal permanent residents be able to um, get stop of deportation and a work permit through a program called DAPA. Um, so it was happening at the courts and we were sitting there thinking what is the message that we can give to our community that reminds them that we are the creators of our own destiny, um, that the, the courage of our parents was to come to this country to build a life here. And so we were thinking through it, and he was like, oh, what about here to stay? Here to stay regardless of what the court says, regardless of what Congress says, regardless of what um, anti-immigrant people say. And so we started using it, and it became um, viral. And now it's kind of like the slogan of resilience of the immigrant community. Here to stay, and you can see it. It's really been beautiful seeing it used by our United We Dream members, but also even folks who are not even involved with United We Dream. Uh, but then we took it a step farther. Um, allies were asking, like, what do I do? How do I support you? I want to be with you, and I know what's happening is wrong, um, especially now in this Trump era. And so uh, we were sitting there, and it's like, how, how do we engage these allies? And so we said, why don't we start a Here to Stay network? And so it basically now we have 60,000 allies that have signed on to Here to Stay through SMS. So basically you, you text Here to Stay all together to 877-877 and you join our network, and so when you join the network, you're saying, I will stand up for undocumented immigrants if they have to go to court to a check-in with ICE. I will show up if there is another executive order that's basically saying, let's deport all of them. Um, I will show up when it's needed. And through it, it's been really beautiful, and just the perfect example of it is uh, this past recess as Congress, well, as 45 decided to ask for uh, billions of dollars to get 10,000 new um, agents uh, of immigration, 5,000 uh, border patrol, get more beds into the detention centers. Um, that was his ask, and so we engaged our Here to Stay network and actually were able to do um, around 200 uh, visits, congressional visits throughout the country. Uh, we were able to also deliver 300,000 petitions saying, no, Congress should not approve this budget that basically criminalizes and deports immigrants. And so it's been really beautiful to use social media. It's been through basically SMS and all that that we've been able to, to use it. I think another example is also, uh, you mentioned, how do we create our own media? Um, and so we there, a few years ago, there was, um, of course, our members were fed up with immigration deporting our families. And so they decided as one of the tactics to actually stop a bus from leaving a detention center that that was going to take people out of the country. And so it was the middle of the night. I was in Texas. Our folks were here in Arizona trying to do it. Um, and all of a sudden, they're like, the bus is coming out. We need to, we need to like uplift it online. And so our entire team started like tweeting and like up uploading the videos. Um, and we were really able to tell the story of like, this is what happens to our community. Uh, people on the ground were able to capture uh, mothers and fathers with shackles on the bus. Um, there were folks that were putting phone numbers of people of like, call my family. And so it was just really like, that's how social media has helped us to really uplift. Like, this is the dehumanizing way that people get deported, number one. Um, and also really uplift, like there is people who, who want to shed light on it. Um, and then it got captured by MSNBC and other networks. But it's just a way of us using, creating our social media, creating our own media, um, so that then it kind of like spreads out and lets the world know what's happening. I also want you, if you could also, I mean, the same question too, but kind of talk more about how you all use data in the dissemination of, of, of the nuance of, of the way you all create your social media. Yeah, so um, 
you know, one of the ways that we've used social media is to help uh, shape the conversation on a particular issue immediately when that issue becomes sort of a, a trending issue related to police violence. So for example, um, you know, when uh, Alton Sterling was killed and then Philando Castile, um, one of the things, you know, immediately as that uh, sort of surfaced as a story, uh, what saying one, like this is, you know, you're gonna see the one case and all of the reporting initially is about like, this is the one thing that happened. But what we know is that, you know, this is not the only thing that's happening in Baton Rouge. Um, in fact, there's probably a whole legacy of discrimination that's occurred that's led up to this point. What we wanna do at the, at the outset is to frame it in that way so that the reporting and the subsequent reaction actually takes into account um, that a systemic change is needed. Um, and so, you know, literally minutes uh, after that hit the timeline, we put out, we, we pulled our database, um, we looked over the police union contract for Baton Rouge, we looked over the police use of force policy, we looked at the uh, civilian oversight policies, literally, you know, all of the policies that govern how that police department operates, all of the data that's publicly available around how that, the outcomes of that police department. Um, and then we tweeted it out, really minutes, in, in minutes uh, afterwards, so the fact that um, you know, every person killed by uh, Baton Rouge Police Department since uh, the beginning of our database was 2013. It's been a black man. Uh, the fact that uh, the police union contract, uh, it contains many different provisions, which we, we pulled the actual language of those provisions that make it harder to hold officers accountable. The fact that not a single civilian complaint against um, the police officers of Baton Rouge resulted in discipline against those officers. The fact that uh, the use of force policy of the police department does not require officers to exhaust all other reasonable means before using deadly force. Uh, and so all of this is sort of framing the initial narrative before it even gets picked up by the national media. So by the time it gets picked up by the national media, uh, some of those statistics make it into that reporting. And so the reporting is actually more systemic in nature and, and, and results in um, a different perspective on what's happening and what needs to be the response. Um, so, you know, technology has allowed us to respond so quickly to what's happening uh, that it helps shape the way that those incidents are portrayed and the ultimate uh, activism around it, um, such that even, you know, now in Baton Rouge, those changes that we identified that needed to happen to the use of force policy, actually the, the new mayor there um, has actually agreed to implement those changes now and the city council has approved it. Um, and so, so that's one of the ways. I think the other way is around digital organizers. This goes beyond social media, um, which is there are so many people that want to get involved in the work, right? There are literally, uh, according to Pew Research, uh, Pew Surveys, there are 104 million uh, American adults that support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, you think about 63 million people voted for Trump, well, there are 104 million people that support the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and the, but how many of them are really engaged in the work, right? Um, maybe a tiny fraction. And so the question is, how can we use technology to actually get everybody who wants to get involved in this work effectively involved uh, to be an effective advocate for change in whatever space they occupy? Uh, and so what we're doing is, is using technology to help do that. So we launched a survey at staywoke.org, um, which was pretty straightforward. It, was, it, it asked people, you know, how many hours a week do you have to contribute? Uh, what, what's your sort of background and skill sets, uh, where are you located, and what types of projects do you want to work on, like policy advocacy, um, you know, elections and campaigns, design and development, uh, or data. And so we actually had 16,000 people sign up in two weeks. Uh, and they filled out this 15-minute survey, <coughs> which, you know, in hindsight, we probably should have made that a lot shorter. Um, <laughs> but 16,000 people went through it. Um, and so we had this wealth of information, right, that we can, so we actually recruited people into various Slack groups using the, the uh, project management system Slack uh, that allowed us to actually complete so many different projects that help support activism. Uh, so we collected information on the police union contracts in the 100 largest cities in America, the use of force policies in the 100 largest cities in, in America because people who had signed up you know, anybody can look online for these things. We taught people how to do, do a public records request to get this information. We work with people to help review those policies to look for these ty this type of language. Uh, we create Google Docs that help people sort of coordinate the work. Uh, and we were able to, to really do this work in a matter of weeks that would take you know, months, if not years, uh, for any one organization or staff to do. Uh, and so effectively using technology to coordinate people and get people involved in the work um, I think has been really, really powerful, and, and we're really at the beginning of that. You know, we have uh, thousands of people, but again, there, there's over 100 million people that want to get involved. How do we get to 100 million people? 
You know, from everything that we, so as somebody who's active on, you know, social media and who spends a lot of time checking out all these hashtags and seeing, you know, it, it, is a way, it, it is a way of bringing awareness, right? For a lot of people who aren't actively engaged, a hashtag is, a, is an entryway. It's a, it's a doorway to finding out information about something they might not know anything about. I mean, that's how most of us learned about the Dakota Access Pipeline or um, even Black Lives Matter. I mean, some curious individual heard it, went to a hashtag and probably started reading. It's like, oh, now I get it. Or maybe they didn't get it. Um, which brings the question of limitations, right? So a lot of, a lot of movements now are, are generated through social media, but we do have attention spans of gnats nowadays. I mean, there's a, there is, you know, people, a perfect example here in DC, a couple weeks ago, there was the, the missing girls thing, right? I mean, I had friends hit me up like, am I, if I come to DC, am I gonna get snatched up as soon as I get off the plane? Now, part of that is misinformation, right? You know, the, the way it was being disseminated, but there's a very real story there but as soon as it was, as soon as one fact is, is, is rebuffed, you know, there was, that one, there was that one meme about like 14 girls going missing in like 24 hours. Well, it wasn't true, it wasn't accurate, but once it was like, oh, well, that's not real, so it's not really a problem, all of a sudden, it goes away, right? The, the attention goes away. Um, and I don't know, that, so I wonder, with this kind of new way of doing things that doesn't have um, <clears throat> months of groundswell to it where it's more immediate, like, are, what do you view as limitations of of, of movements through social media, so to speak, in, 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 your, very, in your respective um, fields. And we'll start here. If there, <laughs> if there are any, maybe there are no limitations, and I'm just, maybe no. I'm making you know. Um, I think it's definitely the whole, like, the five seconds, like, attention span of people, right? Uh, if it's a cool tweet, oh, should I retweet it or not, or what's next? Um, and I think that happens uh, everywhere in, in every issue. Um, and sadly, just, the moment that we're in with, with 45, it's, um, it's very clear, like, you're going to get hit every other day or almost right. every day. Uh, that like it's a like very what's long standing be... troll. Like, this yeah. whole thing is just one long troll. <laughs> yes. Um, that, like, the first week of, of his presidency, I was exhausted. I was just like, I don't know if I'm able to make it for four years of this. Because um, it was hit after hit um, of, of people of color being attacked every single day. And so I think what makes it hard is how do you make sure um, you're in solidarity with all these groups that are getting hit, um, but how do you also make sure what you're trying to say is not lost in the sea of things that get right. thrown out there to the world. Um, and then, I, yeah, I think um, what has been in my mind a lot, um, I've been reading a book about uh, the Holocaust and Hitler and I'm like, okay, how did they survive through a fascist regime? Um, which I feel that's the moment that we're in. And uh, what comes through a lot of the stuff that I've just been reading is like, people decided not to stay quiet. Um, and even if it was just to themselves, they decided to continue like yelling and screaming that this is wrong. Um, and I feel like that's the moment that we're in. Um, I think even if it's, um, I think that the, the trouble is like, how do we make sure it's not just to our people, not just right. among, amongst friends and amongst family, but rather that we're actually able to get out um, to the other side of the world, or, yeah. Right. Um. You know, I'm, I'm happy to speak to it too as well. I mean, there's a really great book called um, Networks of Change by um, Castile, and it talks about like really successful movements globally that were led through social movements, but um, I mean, through social media, but it also at the same time talks about some of the limitations of those movements. And I think that really, you know, I, I kind of reiterate your point that it's, it's hard to, the limitation that I see is making sure that it isn't just within your community, right? Like that you're able to like, when we have something like, some people are sometimes scared to have a voice and say like, when we had the Black Tech Matters event, you know, yes, we circulated it within our Black Tech uh, groups and that sort of thing. But one of the things that I intentionally did was went to groups that um, historically are not very friendly to black tech groups and posted it. You know, hey, we're having this event. And kind of, you know, and, and of course there wasn't a lot of, whether it was in the Facebook group, there weren't a lot of likes, you know, or, but what I was trying to do is honestly, like it's like a poke the bear kind of thing, right. right? Like I wanted to have somebody say something and start this conversation around it. And I think that the, the other limitation is, is that it can be exhaustive, right? Exhausting to kind of lead these movements kind of to your point. Um, because again, you know, for black female founders, 
BFF wasn't something that I was planning on doing. But then when you find out that there, you know, people are kind of get behind you and say, look, like, no, we need you to keep this going. We need you to do this. It's like, okay, well, I don't need like another thing, you know, <laughs> as a, for me, as an independent mother, as a, as a, somebody who's a doctoral student who is also like already has my own business and things like that. But I think that when you, um, uh, you know, there's, Who's, she's been getting a lot of shout outs today, but Angel Rich just wrote a wonderful book um, and she was using um, the history of the black dollar and she was comparing different um, individuals throughout history to current uh, modern day like comparison. So example, so she, she put me in there and I was really honored that she, she compared me to Harriet Tubman, right? And like saying like, you know, th there were times with Harriet Tubman where there were people that didn't want to come with her. You know, there are people that you're like, and I'm sure she didn't want to bear that burden of like trying to lead people you know, out of slavery. And sometimes I feel that way about tech, like in, in you know, trying to get people like, it sounds really simple, but the numbers, you know, that we have and, and how many blacks are in tech, whether it's employees or founders and the successes and the amount of VC funding that we receive is a real problem because, and it relates exactly to this conference, is that's where generational wealth is going to come from. Right. You know, and if we don't have that movement, so the limitations is sometimes just, you know, keeping up with it and trying to get people to come along with something that isn't just a hot topic, that isn't kind of the, you know, the flavor of the day or month. It's like, this is a real cause that is really impacting our community long term. And, you know, I'm honored to be on the stage with individuals who are completely, you know, woke, right? Like on a, a much greater level. But it is in these niche communities and these niche issues that make a major difference. Um, that we we have to try to get that message out there and it's it is very hard to get people to get on board with something in in an environment where people would rather talk about beyonce's pregnancy in 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 recent videos or where you know the the pepsi issue can can stay longer as a as a trending topic than kind of like the work that each of these individuals are doing right so to me that that's a limitation or limitations. And I want to kind of, in terms of limitations, I want to kind of move into a different, a different area, especially for the three, the three of you all and the kind of work that you do specifically, which is, has an actual opposition force, right? Like there is, all right, so, you know, the government, the government, the government. Um, <laughs> like, when your opposition force is effectively such a huge entity that, you know, there's active policies kind of devoted to clamping down on, on, I guess, the voices of people, so to speak, and, and, and not actively recognizing the humanity in these causes and these discussions. Like, how does that factor into the activism? How does that factor into the approach? Like, does it scare the hell out of you at all? I mean, does it, you know, is there a concern there? Um, you know, I want to talk about, and we have a little bit of time, so we can be brief on these things if we could. Um, start here. Yeah, that, you know, that's, that's a, a good, a good place to, to jump off because a lot of times when, you, when you're born into uh, in, in oppressed or in an objectified uh, community or a marginalized community, uh, you, you tend to see the world through those lens. And you want to, we all want to name an enemy sometimes. Sometimes we want to name that enemy as white supremacy. Sometimes we want to name that enemy as patriarchy. Sometimes we want to name that enemy as the doctrine of discovery. Uh, the Christian doctrine of discovery. And those were all appropriate places to direct your energy, your, your liberating energy, the spirit of your liberation. Um, oh, there you go. I can hear myself just fine up here. Right. <laughs> so when we, when we talk, when I'm, tr when I was trying to name an enemy during the, no the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle, because I'm facing five years in prison right now. They charged me with a felony. They charged me for inciting a riot when Donald Trump 
is inciting multiple riots across our nation. So we really, and even when I'm trying to define the purpose of our media, we're, we're all on this journey of, of getting woke and staying woke. Mm -hmm. we, we are, we're, we're there. And for, for me, it is, it is these, th the logic of capital that we have to address. That's the elephant in the room Be because um, these, these institutions of capital, uh, the, the corporate, the evolution of the, of the corporate state, the corporation gaining personhood in the late 1800s. The, the, the corporation gained rights that you and I are endowed with by virtue of our divine birth, our natural rights, our human rights, our constitutional rights, our treaty rights. The corporation now enjoys those rights. And with Citizens United, that institution can now legally and legitimately, right before our very eyes, like there's no, there's no right. conspiracy. We're not conspiracy theorists to, to recognize what's going on. This is happening right in front of our eyes. Like this is, it's a battle that we have to choose to engage in. Because what's, Trump isn't the problem. Trump is just a symptom. He is a manifestation right. of these forces that are outright Absolutely. objectifying certain communities and vilifying and saying in public that you, natural human being who have a birthright to be here, are going to be declared illegal. You black lives do not matter. We're not going to recognize the institutional nature of these injustices. Right. But we end up, if we end up, you know, those are very real struggles. But just like Tupac said, we got money for war but can't feed the poor. There's 59 Tomahawk ballistic missiles that, that have been dropped. <laughs> and we're spending good time fighting these visceral fights, but this, this, the logic of capital, maybe private property, if you, we, we all have to participate in naming that, whatever that is. If we can call, I don't have a problem calling it an enemy. That sounds a little bit, that sounds combative, but we, we just don't have time. So we need to be truthful and, and honest right. with ourselves about where we're going. Um, when I started, I, um, yeah, that was, Thank you. <laughs> right, 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 props. When I started uh, today, I was sharing how I was very ashamed of being undocumented, and, um, and I think that's a lot of what our community um, goes through and still lives through that. Um, I have feeling ashamed that, yeah, I came here without papers because I had no other choice. Um, I made the choice to try to survive with my family, and that's why I ended up in the U.S. And so with that in mind, I think... Um, as you were asking the question, to us, yeah, Trump and his agencies are like basically vilifying immigrants, right? They came out with this voices thing of like, this is where people can report uh, what happens when someone gets either killed or is a victim because of an immigrant. And that's his very great PR strategy of vilifying humans. Um, and so it's, it's been scary um, because I sit next to one of our young, young leaders that uh, picks up our hotline, United We Dreams hotline, where it's basically people calling to report what's happening. Um, on the ground of like, ISIS came to my house, there's a checkpoint that's asking people for papers. And so every now and then, almost every day, she comes into my, to my door and she's like, Juli, um, one of our leaders is in deportation. Juli, someone's parents is in deportation. And so it's, oh. it's scary because that's, that's the place that we're in. Um, but it's also scary because what they're doing is basically not even, um, yeah, dehumanizing our people, um, saying like, oh, you're a criminal because you're trying to survive, um, or you're a criminal because you were trying to feed your family and you ended up using fake papers because that's all you could do. And so it's, it's definitely a new era. It's definitely, um, I think, at the same time, it really um, has emboldened people who were anti-immigrants, who have been anti-immigrants, to really just come out and say it um, out loud uh, with a megaphone. Uh, but at the same time, I also see the resilience of our people of saying, like, I'm going to share my truth. Um, and so it's been um, kind of like different prong approach of like, 
helping our community just know that migrating is not a crime. Um, it's, just, it's, it's love, period. Um, Sorry. Sorry. You're good, you're good. I know. I know. Um, but I think it's, um, it's helping our community understand that. Um, it's reminding our community that the system is not fucked up. The system was created specifically to vilify people of color, to vilify immigrants, to say you're not human, you're not good enough to be protected. Um, and so, yeah, it's a new era, uh, but I think the power of social media, the power of like us, is uplifting those stories. It's not allowing them to go in the quiet. Um, some of the work that we've also been doing is continuing to share the people who actually been deported. Um, to not pretend that they no longer exist, but actually to uplift the stories of their families, what they're going through, how it has affected their entire community. And so, it's been a long week. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things, you know, in addition to sort of the, the government uh, surveillance, harassment, intimidation, uh, is also now I think there has been, there has emerged this network of you know, trolls, folks online who are highly organized and who uh, have been quite effective in making it less, um, Making you not want to be, not want to use the tools that are that are actually necessary to make impact, um, and so you know I think about, for example, leading up to the Republican National Convention, uh, somebody created some photoshopped direct messages. They looked like they were done on Twitter. That looked like they came from me, like in a conversation with Deray, where essentially like it it. it the text of it read that I was like organizing an army basically of like 5,000 or 15,000 people to descend on the RNC and like disrupt the whole thing. Um, which like I thought was cool that they would think that I had like an army of 15,000 people to just descend on the RNC. But, um, <laughs> but like the, the Trump universe lost its mind because they'll believe anything. So they thought like I was like organizing some like insurrection. And so this was trending, like it was being shared and retweeted and people kept like being on my timeline, like we're gonna, if you show up in Cleveland, like we're here waiting for you. Um, there were Craigslist ads taken out that, um, or Craigslist posts taken out requesting former law enforcement, former ex-military to show up and like defend the RNC against me specifically. Um, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> And it got so bad that, so there were articles that, you know, the, the alt-right universe, Breitbart and, you know, the Drudge Report, they were all doing stuff like, is DeRay and, and Sam, are they plan what are they planning for the RNC uh, with the support of Loretta Lynch and like all this stuff they were saying. Um, and it got so bad that I got a call. So I'm, you know, I'm walking around outside, I get a call, it's a no caller ID number. So I pick up the phone and it, it's a, it says, you know, I'm agent, something something with the FBI district office in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and I'm outside your door, are you available to talk? <laughs> so, first of all, don't pick up the phone if it's a no caller ID number. Um, but I'm like, no, I'm not home right now, what did you wanna talk about? And he's like, well, you know, we, we have been following these tweets on Twitter and we wanted to ask you about your upcoming plans for the Republican National Convention. And I was like, I don't have any plans. Like, I didn't think about it. I really don't see what the purpose is of going. Like, and this is all fake. Uh, he says, well, we, I left my card under your door, and we would like to ask you some further questions about it when you have time. When are you available? So I said, oh, I'll get back to you. Um, and I hung up the phone. And so I get home, and sure enough, it's the dude's card, right? FBI card. Um, and I realized, you know, thinking about the call, you know, he was actually telling me, he said, I would strongly encourage you not to attend. Um, and it just blew my mind the fact that, you know, you could basically create anything, say anything bad about anybody in the movement, anybody who's an activist. Um, and there is enough infrastructure uh, online, on Twitter, uh, that it could become a story and that it could actually result in, in harm done to you. It, um, 
and that isn't the first time, right? I've had people, you know, dox my account and, and figure out like my address and say, this is Sam's address. We're going to show up at your house, you know, watch where you are. Um, and it, it's, it's tough, right? It's a burden. So I think one of the limits of using the technology is that, first of all, it's open and inclusive technology, but it's also inclusive of the people that want to do you harm. Um, and they have access to so much information about you and can create stories about you, uh, whether or not they're true. Uh, and I think you know it's good that Twitter now seems to be making some changes to address this, um, but it's still a huge problem. Uh, and and we have to be thinking about one who owns these platforms, right? And how far are they willing to go to actually address these issues? Um, and it goes beyond just trolling. I mean, it, you know, it goes into issues such as you know the election and and all of the fake news that that came out. Uh, it goes as far as you know understanding that there are that people are actually being paid by governments now, whether it's Russia or you know, who knows what, what Breitbart is doing and, and their back channels. But you know, this is becoming state-sponsored as well. Uh, and it's incredibly damaging. And so we have to figure out how to counter that. Um, and it will take, you know, now that they have learned the tools of, of organizing digitally, um, we'll have to outmatch them in this front as well. Um, I, I knew VSB made it when we hit Breitbart. And that was Damon, my partner, wrote something, one of the most incendiary uh, titles I'd ever read in my entire life, something that I did not sign off on. But, you know, hey, we, <laughs> we kind of let each other run, you know, we kind of let each other run amok when necessary. And you'd be amazed. We, even, even we, a web, just a website where we talk about Beyonce and Kanye, and on occasion we talk about things that matter. Um, we've received death threats. We have, um, we have received tons of that. I actually had somebody... Uh, hack into my whole life and delete every one of my accounts. Um, you will not believe how hard it is to get a Gmail account back. Like, seriously. I had to know somebody who worked at Google in order to get my Gmail accounts back. Um, but, all, but one person, over one thing that I'd written, dug into all of my accounts, was sending emails to family members, and all. it was, it got, it was a thing. Um, mm -hmm. The point being, never underestimate, never underestimate how much time other people have. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do now is get to the, the audience Q&A piece. Is, um, we have, I think, some mics gonna, that are going to come around. And we have a question over here. Uh, my name is Eric, Eric Garvan. I've been around tech for a long time. Um, I'm here really to hear young people talk. And um, I'm most interested at this point in developing a program to work with young people and introduce you to the business side of technology. I really want to thank Sam. Um, I really hope that you all, some of the things that you're laughing at are not funny. And particularly, when you put data on, I mean, I hope everyone is aware that there is no privacy on mm -hmm. social media and the internet. And some of the things that have already happened in the past, people my age and older, you all don't know. If you get a letter from someone, don't assume that it came from the person that you think it came from. If Facebook <coughs> sends you a list of faces and says, do you know this person, do you know this person, do you know this person, do you know who sent you that? Do you know why that image appeared on your screen? Like those may or may not be real people. Okay, so just because an email comes to you I mean, you need to look at what happened with COINTELPRO. You need to know how was the Black Panthers dismantled. You need to know how La Raza dismantled. You need to know how the, was the Young Lords dismantled. Okay, names you don't know. You need to know what happened to Adam Clayton Powell. You need to know what happened to Shirley Chisholm. Okay, and what you think of as history, like I hear people say, Oh, yeah, that's historical, and it'll be inspiring. No, it's instructional. This history is instructional. Okay, an FBI agent tells you he's at your door. What do you say? You, need, you all need to talk about that. You need to really, when somebody says that that happened, he left a card under my door. Okay, if you're home, you tell him you're not home, have you lied to an agent? Is that a charge? A federal agent? If they break your door in, and then you, they have on tape, you weren't home. 
then you are home. If something happens to you, what is your recourse? So I just want to say, I mean, I'm hearing people laughing about things, and I don't know why you're laughing. I don't think you really understand what you're up against. And I really think this idea that these people don't know what they're doing, and if we educate them and they'll figure it out, they know exactly what they're doing. And so many of these techniques are so old. They're so old that if you all would dig into the history a little bit more and understand and really start talking about how to develop techniques to counter the moves that are coming against you, it would really serve you. Interesting that you would say that. I don't mean to cut you off, but that is one of the more powerful parts about social media I'm going to say is because I think in odd ways what you get is when a situation like that happens, up pops a video from somebody who's in the know who now tells you how to deal with this. I mean, one of the most viewed videos I remember after a lot of police brutality, after this started to become a, I mean, it's always been a thing, but a very uh, a noteworthy thing in the media and everything, you start seeing videos from police officers like, here's how you don't, basically, I hate to say it this way, here's how you don't die encountering me. And even though there's some levity in the way that we're saying these things, I think there's a, there's a very acute understanding of the, of the danger and of the pain involved in all of it. I mean, especially from, I, I imagine almost everybody in this room probably has a very clear understanding that there's jokes, but underneath those jokes is a very real, real fear. And I mean, everybody here is doing work that's intended to, to make sure that we don't have to tell these jokes forever, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of the reason why we're all even here. So I think it, I, I, as, you know, as an elder, and I absolutely completely respect everything that you've been through and done. I know I, I actually have these conversations with my family. They're all from Alabama. I have people that, you know, Martin Luther King kind of stuff. I get those speeches. Um, I think there's a, amazingly, these kids nowadays tend to be a lot more informed about things I would think that maybe they weren't going to be informed about because of social media, too. I think it's become as much as information. Now, everybody's not using it for, you know, everybody's not on social media to get, to get informed, but um, I do think that they're out of some of these situations, like what you're speaking of, even the situation I went through when we got my whole life hacked, I never got doxxed, but, you know, out of that came information and instruction on how to deal with these situations that ensure that other people who might deal with them will learn from them and be able to, you know, hopefully come out of those and, and on, on, on the safe side of things. You know, but I, I do think that's a very good point, sir. Um. I just want to build on something, um, this, the insight that this gentleman raised, and I think that it's, there's a bigger question I have for all of you and really admire the work that you're doing and and just you know you're telling your truth and being very authentic um, but the question I have is how do you bring along uh, the boomer generation and a whole other generation of folks who may not be on social media I'm so lucky to have a tween who's shows me all the YouTube stars and my mother's willing to be in musically videos with her granddaughters and all of those things but what you're doing is creating a movement but to a very targeted group of people who don't always go to the polls and vote so how are you now thinking about developing your message and your movement to appeal to the people who really are going to the polls and voting, and voting your interest as well as my interests? Just a question. Well, I can sort of preface it by saying, you know, we want our folks to vote too, right? Um, and one of the things that's been clear when you look at, you know, this past election is that you know, if people who didn't vote voted, uh, not only would the Democrats have won, you know, the, the presidency, but probably actually the House and the Senate too. Um, and so how do we actually work with our folks to turn out to vote, make sure they're getting informed, and then build these, path these pathways and these bridges to other generations as well who use different technologies? So for example, you know, what I've learned, when you look at um, like the resistance groups that have emerged post-election, um, you know, those are predominantly uh, sort of middle-aged white women, uh, according to the demographics and like who emerged. And, and all of that. Um, like our folks were already organized since before the election. Um, but they're using different technologies. They're using Facebook predominantly. Um, like I don't use Facebook, I'm on Twitter. Uh, the younger generation is on Snapchat. Um, and so 
you know, I can't be an expert in how to organize folks on Facebook because I haven't used Facebook since like ninth grade. Um, but what I can do is build bridges across different groups, right? So we have conversations um, with some of those other organizations to figure out, you know, how are we aligning our strategies, right? So, um, you know, whether that is working with Indivisible uh, to make sure that their work is actually inclusive of folks beyond that demographic. Um, you know, those are conversations that we have, right? So I don't think that we can be sort of the, the be all end all for everybody to organize because we have a particular set of skills um, that resonates with a particular demographic and, and, and generation. Um, and we need to be able to, to double down on that and, and maximize that and leverage that potential while building bridges to other groups that are more effective in organizing other, other demographics as well. Uh, for United We Dream, is, um, I mean, we know our immigrant U.S. is the main ones that we work with. Uh, many of them have, of course, either undocumented parents or U.S. citizens. Like, the system is pretty messed up, so you have mixed status families. Uh, but so what we've done is, yeah, a lot of our messaging and a lot of our work is done through the Twitter and the Facebook, but also acknowledging like, okay, there's a Snapchat for the younger gener generation, so how do you engage those that might be U.S. citizens that should be voting for their parents? Um, we know there is a big follow of parents uh, of many of our leaders, and so many of them are uh, undocumented, and so some of our stuff is in Spanish only, um, and using kind of like a pop culture, right? Like the soap opera, like um, comedia, or like um, stuff that resonates with our people. Um, of sacar la chancla, of like pulling out the, um, <laughs> uh, pulling out the, uh, like the sandal when they're like telling you like, you better go vote. But using that kind of stuff that really like resonates with our people, but realizing that there is different audiences that you just really need to um, try to do some of them, acknowledging that you can't do all of them. Um, but yeah. I, I would just, I, I would add, uh, I went through this when I ran for the United States Congress in North Dakota, because the voting block is, is definitely, like my daughter created my Snapchat. It's the same as, as the brother here. And so you have to figure out ways. And, and what I've found is that it, there's enough people in this room. You never need everybody to jump on board with whatever's going to happen, wherever you want to, to guide uh, the direction. Uh, you just need a critical mass. And I tell you, there's enough people in this room that there is a critical mass to do great and big things, but you, you've got to live your life in real life is, what, is how I think of it. Because now we're in an age where we're documenting everything. Everything is, is snappable and tweetable and Instagrammable. Like every, we're not living life in real life that much anymore, but we need to activate our networks. With that, I wanna, I wanna tell you, please follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you back. <laughs> At Chase Iron Eyes. I really would, I don't, I didn't bring business cards, so hit me up outside too. Yeah, and I just want to close with this, inviting people to the conversation, because that's inclusion in itself, right? And a lot of times we don't invite people. One of the things that I love is my family has its own, you know, um, Slack team, and my mother is on there all the time, you know, um, she's much older and disabled, but she's in there, you know, posting things and sharing things. And it's just when people invite people, there's an assumption sometimes by different generations that um, people aren't willing to adopt. Um, but there, my mom is in, and parents actually are activists from the civil rights movement. And so whatever way that they can get engaged, they're willing to do that and they're willing to adopt to the medium and that in order to participate. So I just think that, you know, one of the things, especially in technology, what I, I talk about is being a triple minority, right? Um, I talk about being um, not only a woman, a woman of color, and a woman of color over 30. And so there's an assumption sometimes that, you know, oh, yeah, you're too old for this, like, and you can't do this, and you can't be hip, and you don't, whatever. Like, that's, the thing about it is, is that that's, the technology is supposed to be the thing that brings us together and unites us and allows us to tell our stories, to share. Um, and so I just, I just encourage people to, to, um, you know, make that invitation and, and extend it to others to get them activated. And that's our time up here. So if we could please grant a, a round of applause for our panelists up here. And, uh, uh, thank you all. Thank everybody for, for, paying for being here to listen to all these things these wonderful people had to say. And uh, go out and do the work.